Namo Adidafa, good morning. Thank you for joining me for today, Wednesday's daily practice check-in. Listen, listen, listen. This beautiful sound calls us back to our true home. The third wonderful precept, aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct, I vow to cultivate responsibility and learn ways to protect the safety and integrity of individuals, couples, families, and society. I am determined not to engage in sexual relations without love and a long-term commitment. To preserve the happiness of myself and others, I am determined to respect my commitments and the commitments of others. I will do everything in my power to protect children from sexual abuse and to prevent couples and families from being broken by sexual misconduct. Today we're finishing the section on Kama, the relational field from Ajahn Suchito's Kama and the End of Kama. Aware relationship in accordance with Dhamma is therefore crucial as our karmic inheritance is to be in relationship to the planet and to the people we share it with. Dhamma practice has to include a sense of relationship of a living with that has meaning and purpose. This means learning to interact in often messy and tangled real-life situations through basic kindness and respect, no matter what and whose programs are running at the time. We change the rules of being in relationship away from winners and losers and higher and lower to those associated with non-attachment. We relate because here we are, and let's make it right. And that shift to relational integrity realigns our comic tendencies in valuable and valuing ways. Because when our intentionality is based on being within something that is upright, mutual, and supportive, it's not aimed at controlling it or carving out a position within it. It's not about being the best in the group, but about being responsibly engaged within it. Then, instead of coming from an intention that is compulsively based on proving oneself or denying relationship, we can then enjoy our social group. We align it to generating the good, but not in order to acquire any trophies. I remember reading an account of a game played by a tribe living in the Amazon basin. The British field worker who was observing the game couldn't understand the rules at first. He noticed that the players of the games would split into two teams, who were not necessarily equal in terms of numbers or apparent strength. Each team would grab a large log and hoisting it onto their shoulders start running towards a point a hundred meters or so ahead. The logs also were not of exactly the same size or weight. As he watched, one team would draw ahead of the other, and as it did so, a member of the leading team would leave his or her team and join the other team. Whichever team was in the lead, members of that team would peel off and join the losing team. As a finishing line drew into sight, the excitement would rise until the teams crossed the line, often with very little distance between them. Eventually, the field worker found out the aim of the race. It was to have both teams cross the line at the same time. That aim was carried out through attention and strenuous effort, but with an overriding benevolent intent to arrive at a place with no winners and no losers. It's not a bad analogy for the qualities that support spiritual friendship. Spiritual friendship is a stepping stone, one that reminds us of these values and models, and models them to a degree. But spiritual friendship is not about ultimately bonding to an individual or a group. It's about cultivating a relatedness which steadily brings values of morality, compassion, and inquiry to mind. Then it leads on to the firmest foundation for relationship, that of relating one's actions to a field of value.
May all beings be well. May all beings be happy. May all beings be peaceful. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you again for joining me this morning.